To be a teacher for the Lord is a great uh, responsibility. Also, it's a great privilege. It, it is beautiful to speak up for Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. And the, the subject that we have been dealing with uh, has to do with the divine obligation that Jesus has placed upon us as Christians. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They that believe are saved. They that believe not are damned. There are only two kinds of people in the world. That's not rich and poor. And that has nothing to do with being illiterate or educated. It has to do with the saved and the damned. If you, if you are not saved, you are damned. And, and uh, we got to get that across to people. And we're the only administrators of life on the face of this earth. We, we, we preach life. And with the words coming out of our spiritual being, they receive life. So what a privilege it is. And so in our teaching on world missions, we have been dealing with the subject as how do you take that life to these people? And on page 44, we have been dealing with world missions it is, is one of the uh, aspects of you're going to plant a tree or give a fruit. Now, most missionary endeavor in the world has been giving fruit. You're so poor, I'll give you something. I'll give you some clothes. I'll give you some bread, you know. But you don't have strength when you're giving something. You have strength when you plant the tree, which is the church, and they develop the tree. And they have their own fruit. Uh, some missionaries get upset uh, in various countries because the people want to worship different from us and they, they want to administrate different from us and, and uh, we get upset about it. I arrived in Hong Kong to build a church a few years ago. We rented a stadium and we told a man named Brother Soong, he says, would you set up the ushers for us? I, I asked for the ushers on the first night and about 12 women came walking up. I said, who are you? They said, ushers. I said, since when did women become ushers? They said, right now. I said, okay. <laughs> I found out that no man in China will usher. That's putting him down. And that for him to have the prestige he wants, he can't usher. So our church in Hong Kong until this day has lady ushers. They do a good job too, by the way, and after all, they are good looking. <laughs> but I could have gotten angry and said, in my church, and where I come from, me an usher. And it would have broken their hearts, you see. So we planted the tree. They've got their own fruit. They, sit, they take care of themselves. They administrate themselves. And I believe that's the way God wants it. Now, I just said something that's much bigger than you ever realized because 90% of all missionary work is done opposite of what I just told you. And, and so what we need to do is to uh, know how we can evangelize the world in our time. And all the people said, <clears throat> now turn over to page 45. Uh, we have been talking in unit number three about the, the immortal tree. Uh, which is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, dealing with immortal persons. And then, and number four, uh, we're going to talk about that indigenous church that I was just speaking about. The psalmist said that the believer is like a tree planted by rivers of living waters. That's Psalm 1, 3. And, and he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in his season. His leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. And so, uh, Christians are, believers are, uh, uh, compared to a tree. And if one believer is compared to a tree, then a lot of believers can be. And so, we believe in planting the church in its own soil, locally, out there, not our soil, over there. It's an amazing how so many missionaries want to Americanize people when they go to another country. Well, what we're doing may not be so clever either. Why don't we leave them alone? They may come up with something better than ours, you see. Possibly Dr. Cho has proven that over in Korea, that he didn't have to have an American church, he could have a Korean church, and they're not doing bad. 
they're getting up close to 800,000 members in one church. And it's not only the largest church in the world, it is uh, the richest church in the world because everybody pays tithes. Are you here? So what we need to do, wherever we go, as a representative of Jesus Christ, is plant the church. Make it sovereign. Believe in the people. And go back and help them. But let the tree be a local tree. And all the people said? Yes. And so uh, at the top of the page 46, I'm, I've labored in, in so many missionary endeavors in, 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 in so many uh, nations of the world and so forth. And uh, have a lot of experience in what we mean by planting a tree. Now in the middle of this number B up there, uh, I give you a, a thing that's very strong with me. Uh, and that is, if you're going to plant a tree, plant it in a good place. Now, the denomination that I used to belong to had been in the Philippines 25 or 30 years. They had no church building in any city in the nation, but they did have some in some rural areas. I mean, a building worth, you know, seven, eight hundred dollars or a thousand dollars or something like that. But in a city, they didn't have one. Now, you see, that's just the opposite of what Paul did. Paul planted his churches in the greatest cities on the face of the earth at that time. When he said to Rome, I'm coming. And when he wrote letters from there a little later and said, they of Caesar's household greet you. He'd gotten his mother-in-law saved already. He had moved in on the royal family. But you can't do that in a village, you see. So the church primarily should be planted in the influential cities of the world. You, you say, well, why aren't they? The people that go don't have the ability to do that. You go into a city to establish a church, and you can't be right out of Bible school. You have to have a, a background of knowledge and experience, or you can't do it. Then you have to have money. You have to believe God for money. The, the property that we have there in Manila today that, you know, we were 30 years ago uh, were buying, it's worth between seven and eight million dollars now. We wouldn't be able to even think about buying it now, but in those days right after the war, we bought the first lot for $25,000. Then we bought the second lot for about the same amount, about $25,000. And, and, and so now they, they have a wonderful location on the main street of the whole city, right across the street from the United Nations building, one block from the Hilton Hotel, a third of a block from one of the light, nicest uh, hospitals in the nation called the Doctor's Hospital. So we are seated at the right place, you see. We would never have been able to influence that nation if we'd gone out into a village when I went there and said, now let's be humble and go to a village. No, you're not humble, you're stupid. And that little village will always need you and need your money. They don't have any capacity to take care of themselves. And so when we go to a land to establish the church, establish it strong, our American companies do. You look all over the Philippines, and you see these great American companies, one right straight after the other. And, and they're all well located in great buildings, and, and, and they're in Manila, in the capital city. And so the church should have the same. And it should be established in the right place with great strength. And all the people said? Now, and number five, it says you cannot plant what you do not have. I've marked mine in, 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 in yellow here last night. You, you can't give what you don't have. If you don't have a powerful ministry of leading people to Jesus, you can't give those people the power of God if you don't have any. So who you sin he would have to produce after his own kind. And if you sin weakness, that's the result you're going to get. 
Paul was the best God had, and God sent the best he had to open up these nations. Well, we need to do the same. I mean, why should we send those that couldn't raise up a church in a village hardly, send them to a foreign land to a big city, and let them tremble and shake and be discouraged and disappointed and afraid and run and hide? But someone great enough to accept the challenge that we got the greatest thing in the world and you've got to have it, and I'm going to plant the church of Jesus Christ in strength. When we went to the Philippines, the Lord said, uh, you believe I'm going to bless you? I said, that's what you said. Do you believe I'm going to bless you more than you, that I have ever blessed you before? I said, uh, that's what you said. He said, well, why don't you go ahead and start the building? What you waiting on? Well, I could have said, well, the main thing I'm waiting on, I don't even have five people. And to buy a B-52 hanger and put it up, you put a few thousand in it. I said, well, if you've got faith, go ahead. So before we had a congregation, we bought the ground. I began to put up this enormous steel building. And the whole country thought we were crazy. Our denomination says, don't buy anything in our name. We know you won't ever be able to pay for it. And I said, seeing you're not known here, can't buy anything in your name anyway. Forget it. Buy it in my name. The local radio station out there that was run by missionaries says, oh, don't do it. You're going to ruin the name of Christianity out here. I said, wait till we get through and you'll find out. The local Bible society that tended the whole nation said, this building whole half the Protestants in Manila, what are you going to do? You're going to take them all? I said, I'll take everybody that comes. We never turn the sheep away. We just feed them. So we didn't have any friends in the matter except Jesus. But I kept prophesying that the day we dedicate it, you won't be able to get in it. And the day we dedicated it, we had twice as many outside as we had on the inside. You see. So you have to, inside of you, decide whether God's a big God, where God can do it or not. And we're going to reach out beyond ourselves and to God. I had nothing, nothing, absolutely nothing, but God had a lot. So we just began to use what he had. And all the people said, now look at verse 5. You cannot plant what you do not have. If you're not an apostle, you're sure God cannot have planted an apostolate church. Without seed, there is no planting. Isn't that amazing? If you don't really have the gospel burning in your heart, you don't have anything to plant at all. Nothing. So first you've got to have the seed, the seed of life, of the power of God, the, po the power of, uh, uh, of being born again yourself. You have to have the seed. You cannot give what you do not possess. In order to give away something, you must, you must have something to give. So everyone that goes can only give what they've got inside. So we need to pray for, for those that go. That God will help them to have something to give. That God will rise up in there with a ministry that will actually change other people's lives. Can you say amen? And that, that's what God wants. I don't see it right here, but I might come across it. I had a saying that was this way. Don't ever take anything to a foreign field. You're not willing to give the people and never touch it again. And that, that's hard. That means my wife. If I'm not willing to lay her down out there in death, better not take her. If I have money, if I'm not willing to lay it down, leave it, I better not take it out there. Most squabbles on the foreign field, and if I were to start naming them for you that's going on right now, you'd be absolutely amazed. There are many lawsuits all over the world today over the white man's money he brought out there, and the other people want to keep it for themselves, and so they're having powerful troubles about it. I didn't take much out there. I took a, a new automobile. I didn't sell it when I left. I, I gave it to my successor free. Just signed it over so you can have it free. We had a, a nice piano and, and a few things like that. I never sold one cent. I gave it to him. 
because I have inside of me. Don't ever take anything to the field that you can't give to the people. You ought to hear that because I don't know of hardly anybody else that feels that way about it. The things, the things that I left there, when the next person left, he sold them, put them in his pocket. And I asked him, I said, did you sell my stuff? He said, your stuff. I said, you gave that to me. So he sold it. But I feel that if I take something there, I'm going to give it. Jesus had no reservations. All he brought to this earth, he gave it away. He didn't try to keep any of it and take it back. Don't go to the mission field unless you're willing to give your children, your wife, your money. Don't go out there and fight with people over material things. Give it to them. And they'll always love you for it. Can you say amen? I continued with this give and take here in number six. Uh, pygmies produce pygmies. They don't produce giants. Large people produce large people. And small preachers produce small churches. There's no need of you thinking we're going to change the world with people that can't even change a village at home here. Can't even teach a Sunday school class, hardly. Now, they might can be a blessing out there. They might join up with some little native preacher. That's what most of them do anyway. Join up with some little native preacher and help him in his program. Well, if you studied his program, you wouldn't want to be associated with it. And, and so uh, you got to decide whether you're an apostle to the nations or a little helper in the kingdom. And I presume we need both. It's all right. I'm only talking about establishing the church of Jesus Christ that can fight the devil, that can resist governments, you see, and, uh, and stand up until they die. That's what we mean about the kingdom of God. The most important thing in the whole world is the gospel of Jesus. And we ought to treat it on that high standard of saying it's so great, I wish to be a part of it. In, in, in the point number seven that we talk about rice Christians, uh, we have those, that's a Chinese phrase, we have those on every mission field. They're people who deliberately <laughs> become associated with you to get something from you. No other is. And, and you may not even know it. Everybody would know it but you, of course, because they, 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 they understand the situation. In Hong Kong, I've had so many experiences, you know. In Hong Kong, our house was full. You know, they, we bought the fourth floor of a downtown building. It was full. And I got up on a Sunday morning. I said, I want to give you the policy of this church. I said, if you expected me to give you something, you can leave today and never come back. But I don't have anything to give you. If you think we're going to give out food here, you can just leave and go join one of the other churches. They may have some. I don't have anything. I said, the only thing I have is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I'll give it to you. But if you're here for financial reasons, thinking that I have hidden funds that I'm going to give you, you can leave and never come back. Are you here? I lost half my congregation that day. They never showed up anymore. And I told the rest of them, I said, no, if you want those beggars back, I'll go look for them for you. They said, oh, no, no. I said, then go and find somebody and bring them in here. In six months, we had, we had, we had six millionaires in our church. You know, they went to, they, they went to men that owned factories, and they went to men that were physicians, and they went to, they went to people that were important in the community. And, and, and the whole town was saying, some roads owned a man that ever came in here and got these rich people. Because we always got the poor people. Well, that's because they didn't say what I said. When I said, I don't want you, you say, don't you love those people? I don't love beggars. No, of course not. Nowhere, here or anywhere else. I love people that have a source. They know God. And they can command the riches of heaven to come on their lives. Anywhere they are. You see, not one of you can say that I ever ask you for anything. No one in this town can ever say, I ever asked them for anything. If God wants me to have something, that's his business. And, and if I have to go and beg for myself, then I'm, I'm, I'm not God's servant anyway. Are you here? 
Her church is the richest church in Hong Kong, no doubt. When my wife and I preached a citywide meeting there two or three years ago, they invited the helpers of, of, the, of the crusade out to a big dinner the night before it opened. There were about 300 people there. And we sat down and ate in this beautiful hotel. And our pastor stood up and says, I, I'd like to tell you that the church is going to pay for all of this. It was about $15 a piece, American money. Not another church in Hong Kong could have done it, you see. But ours could and have money left over. You see why? I taught them to be sovereign. I taught them to tithe. And now they got a good strong tree with deep roots. You can't knock it over. And, and so that's what God wants here and everywhere else. And all the people said, so we, we, we should produce after our own kind. We don't want people relying on us because we're not to be relied on. Only God can be the, 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 the true one to give us strength in the time of need. Can you say amen? And then in number eight, in the beginning of modern mission, many missionaries saw how poor the people were in the lower strata of society and concluded that money uh, from back home could come and pay all the expenses of the church. When we arrived in Manila, that's what they were all, that's what they were all doing. But I, I said, no, that's not the way. That's not the way we want. We, we, won't, we won't do that. You say, but the people are poor. Well, they're going to always be poor the way you're messing around. When we opened our church in, in Manila, my car was the only car parked at the church. One. You go there today, the whole parking lot's full. And for three blocks around there, you can't park. You say, why? I taught those people. If you're poor, it's because of sin. Start living right, doing right. You'll be, you'll be prosperous. And then you got the evidence of it. Now, you know, they've got it. They're no longer like they were when we went to town. It's a different world today. How many believe God's a good God? Now, those people could never have been strong like that unless they were taught strength. And that's what we have to do. That's what you have to do. It's what I have to do. That's what God would like for us to do. All right. And then and, uh, on page 47, and, 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 and every big city, they, they, you know, in every country they have big cities. Satan is convinced that he can have them. We have to take them away from him. Your E there. Uh, I have observed missions in more than a hundred nations, and I, I tell you about that. In F, in all my missionary work, uh, the needs have been supplied locally. I've, I've never, when I went around the world it, it, in 1934, I only had $12 when I left this country, and I didn't have one person to give me a dime. I was supported for the first three years just by the natives of wherever I preached. Got along good, too. Got along fine. So maybe you're wrong in saying they can't do something. And maybe you're seeing what the devil has done to them rather than what God could do for them if we got them into God. And all the people said, we, we, we must reach for that. The greatest story of local financing is Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho. And that's, that's in G. And, and I've already told you about it. So in H, if you plant a tree, there is life and fruit which belongs to those local people. And if you, if you serve fruit to them, the recipient is hungry again in a few hours. Then you get into the next great phase of that, number nine, uh, and that is the raising up of, of leaders uh, um, among those people. They can lead if you give them the opportunity. And another, they may not lead like you would lead, but who says we're right? I mean, uh, they may be right. And, and so we have to make a place to where we can say, listen, listen, we want to just establish Jesus here and that's all. We, we, we don't want to build an American organization here. We just want to establish Jesus in your heart. The Bible was born in the Orient, take it back to the Orient and let the Orient do the way the Orient wants to do it. Just so it's clean, just so it's pure, just so it's good. We always want to have a good church. Can you say amen? Don't want to tolerate sin. Now you get to that side, that's the side where I love to come in strong. That in holiness, we, we have to stick to the line and say, now listen, your idols have to go. Your adulterers have to go. Your lying has to go. Your stealing has to go. We're going we're to have Christians here. And, 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 and that's, don't, that's not an American doctrine, by the way. That's a Jesus doctrine. And, and that we want them to be a holy church. And God wants them to be a holy church. And so you and I, you and I must do this. 
You can pray, and God answers prayer. You can give, and God will bless you for it. 